I've got all these digital assets. What do I do with them? Hi, I'm John Strohmeyer, an estate planning attorney with Strohmeyer Law. Now, we know about the two main types of property that people think about. Physical property, which is something you can pick up and hold. Then there's also real property, so dirt under your feet that you happen to own. There's also various types of intangible property. And these are the sort of things that you can't put your hands on, but you still consider your stuff. So we're going to put aside the tangible property, the stuff on your desk, the bookshelf full of stuff behind you, the pennant on the wall, wherever it is. I can't point to it. I don't know. My dog who's bothering me as I try and record a video. All of this stuff can be personal property. You can also think about the house. That's easy to deal with. File a deed. You can transfer it. The real issue is we have all of these digital assets now, and we need to know what we can do to transfer them on to the next generation if we want to. So these can come in various forms. What I'm not going to be talking about are things like your online accounts. Just because you can access your Chase account, your Wells Fargo account, whatever that bank or brokerage account is, just because it's got an online portal, this isn't a digital asset. What we're thinking about here are things like your Facebook account, your online photo albums. What about your Amazon account? Do you have any domains? You might want to be sure you know how to deal with those. So first and foremost, you're going to be looking at terms of service for these accounts. What happens when you pass? Can you pass anything along? You're going to have to go through and figure out what happens. For example, with Facebook, they'll allow people to come in and take over those accounts so that they can basically set you to a deceased account. It stays up as some sort of tribute page. Twitter has similar things, but it's important to know what is going to happen and starting to look at it before something happens to you. What you don't want is to leave your family in a position where they can't access these accounts. So what can you do? Well, first, you're going to have access to these accounts through some sort of password and login combination. You want to make sure that everybody knows where those are. The big problem with this is if your family doesn't know what you own or where it is, they're not going to have any chance of finding it or ever logging in. So again, having some sort of password storage system is crucial for this. A lot of people say, well, I'll just keep it in my head. The problem with this is once your head is no longer accessible, we can't get into those accounts and we certainly don't know where they are. Some people move up and they start keeping notes, whether electronic or paper. These are better. It's not the best because those passwords don't stay current. You may have written something out. You may have then changed that password, which means what's written down isn't accessible anymore. You may not have also written down how to get into the computer where you've already automatically logged in. What I really like are having some sort of outside password manager. Personally, I use Dashlane, but any of the major ones, one uh, one pass keeper, if it's a reputable company that's putting it out and you like using it, that's more important. Why? It's going to make sure that you're using randomized passwords to store those. That gives you an extra layer of protection so somebody doesn't go in and once they figure out that your password combination is some uh, sequence of your birth date, your wedding date, your kids' names, and your dog's names, well, they can get into a lot of accounts. If you have randomly generated passwords from your password manager, it's going to be an extra layer of protection to keep somebody from just randomly getting into one of your accounts and then getting into all of your accounts. The next thing to think about is can someone else access that, access that account on your behalf once you're gone? What you will see in a lot of terms of service is that the only the person who is allowed to access that account and the owner of that account is the only person who gets in there. If they find out if Google, if Facebook, if Twitter finds out potentially that somebody else is logging into your account, they can freeze the account. They might even shut it down. Now, if you've got an account that's worth something, if you've got lots of followers, if you have a bank, uh, some you know, some following email account that is tied to this, you may not want to lose the value of that list of the access to that audience. So making sure you're complying with the terms of service so that anybody can get in and manage that on your behalf. This can come up in the case of domains. Generally, people are going to be buying domains in their own name. Uh, I, for one, use Hover to go get my accounts or go get my domain names. And 
previously, I had been buying them in my own name. I've since transferred this to an entity, uh, to, to the law firm. The law firm owns all the websites. Why? Well, even if I had been logging in under my own name, if somebody comes in and logs in later, they can't get into that account. There's nothing else that they can do. There's no amount of password cracking because the owner of the account wasn't the entity. And there are stories out there of people who have bought domains that have a lot of value and then nobody could get in and manage the re-up or the renewal of the domain registration. So it's waiting until the domain registration expires and then somebody else gets to come in and bid on that account versus if they'd still had access to the account, they could come in and basically just renew it on time for the normal fee that they'd have to. So a lot of the things that we need to think about when it comes to digital property are the same things we think about when we are thinking about tangible property and real property. Yes, it is a different class of property because you can't reach out and touch it, but you still want to have a good inventory of where, what it is and what you own. Next, people need to know how do they access this. It's one thing to say, well, you know, John has this Twitter account or that YouTube account. Once he passes, how do we get into it? Where are the passwords? How do we know where this is? So again, inventory number one, access ability number two, and then finally, what should happen to this? There are a lot of services out there that will help you manage this, like DCS, Directive Communication Services, that will effectively allow you to set beneficiary designations for your digital assets. Say, on my death, make sure that this person owns or has access to this account. Make sure that this person gets access to this Twitter account. If you happen to have an Ashley Madison account, close that account down. Don't ever tell anybody it ever existed. And this gets carried out, and that's part of what they're doing for you. Uh, looking at all the things that can happen, you want to kind of take stock, look at where you're going, look at what should happen to those assets, and then basically construct your plan with that in mind. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this helps you clear up some of the questions you've got about what you can do with your digital assets. We're accumulating so many more of them now. We're going to be dealing with this for years to come. Looking for other answers? We've got them. Click on one of the other videos and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.